Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another book review on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and take, today we're taking a look at a, well, a very Germanic titled book here. We have Ott Helmut von Losnitzer, Technical Director of the Mauser Company, 1933 to 1945, An Oral Recollection. Uh, very, very German sort of title for a book about a very German sort of guy. Uh, let me start with some biographical detail about Ott Helmut von Losnitzer, uh, or as he changed his name to when he came to the United States, Otto von Losnitzer. Uh, he was born in 1898 in Germany. Uh, if you think about it, you may realize this puts him basically at the perfect age to have been fighting in World War I, which he did. Uh, he fought with a machine gun unit in World War I, was awarded the Iron Cross at least once, uh, did pretty well, retired after the war, you know, his term of service ended, the German military largely disbanded after the war. Uh, however, he was called back into service in the 20s and ended up working for what was basically the German Ordnance Corps, um, the Inspectorate of Weapons, which then turned into, I don't remember the exact name of the department, but basically the German Ordnance Corps. And he was actually quite the respected expert on machine guns. And a large part of this is the fact that during World War I, when he had been uh, fighting as a machine gunner, the German military had been using a lot of captured and rebuilt foreign machine guns. So he had quite a bit of experience with guns beyond just what the German military had formally adopted. So things like Lewis guns that had been rebuilt in 8mm Mauser by the Germans, that sort of thing. So uh, in the 20s he ended up putting together uh, basically a military reference museum slash collection and was involved in the, the uh, the, uh, not, not necessarily the adoption, but the investigation of new foreign weapons that might be of interest to the German military, and really did quite a good job of this. Uh, he had risen to the rank of major by 1933 when Hitler took power, and at right about this time he was he had actually been approached by a number of different German uh, arms companies who were looking to hire people with expertise out of the military. He was approached by Simpson and Sewell, or Simpson of Sewell, um, and someone else, and then in 1933 he was approached by the Mauser company, and it, basically he thought, well these guys, you know, what they want isn't feasible. And so he talked to these three directors of Mauser, and he, a compared to them, a lowly major in the German army, basically told them that they need a complete new research and development division at Mauser, they need to have a guy on the board of directors responsible for it, um, and that's the only way that they can actually successfully compete for German military procurement. They had to have serious uh, endurance trials and firing trials, and, and in his opinion Mauser didn't really know what they were trying to get into for this sort of work. Well, much to his surprise, uh, these Ma the Mauser board of directors came back and said, well, okay, we want to hire you to do that. And so in 33 he ended up as technical director uh, for the Mauser company, running their research and development department. And he would hold that job until 1945, uh, when obviously uh, the Mauser company was kind of shut down. So during his time at Mauser he was responsible for a remarkable amount of technological development. Uh, in terms of firearms this was focused largely on aircraft cannon, especially the, the uh, MG and MK213 cannons, which would prove to be very popular with the Allies and were developed into a number of uh, particularly British guns after World War II, uh, and also of course the development of the Sturmgewehr and what would become the Setme and later HK uh, roller delayed blowback designs. That work was all done at Mauser under von Losnitzer's direction. Um, interestingly he also did a lot of development, or was head of and responsible for, a lot of development of very important things that a lot of people don't really think about. Things that allowed production to be more efficient, allowed research and development to be more efficient, things like uh, high-speed camera systems. Uh, he developed one really interesting, or again, it, his department he was responsible for, developing um, a really interesting, not quite camera, but a device, kind of like, an, look kind of like an oscilloscope or a lie detector really, where um, it could actually track the displacement over time of a part in a firearm at extremely high speeds. And that was a tool that was extremely useful in determining or in diagnosing problems with 
uh, automatic weapons, prototype automatic weapons. Uh, and beyond that, more menial things like spring testing machines. So we want to know if, for example, uh, the recoil spring that has been designed for this machine gun can last 30,000 rounds. Well, one option is to load 30,000 rounds of ammunition and dump them all through the gun, which costs a fair amount of money and then you're dealing with a lot of other issues at the same time. Or you could design a machine that would take that spring and compress it with the right amount of force and distance uh, as the machine gun would, and you can just stick a spring in the machine, turn it on, and have it run 30,000 cycles, and presto you get your answer. And if your answer isn't correct, let's say it only lasts 20,000 rounds, it's very easy to redesign the spring, throw the new model back into that testing machine and try it again for a far lower cost than having to go out with another 20 or 30,000 rounds of machine gun ammunition. That's a lot of the sort of work that von Losnitzer did for Mauser. Now, after the war, uh, he was of course a, a person of great interest to the Allies, and he ended up moving to the United States in 1947 under the auspices of Operation Paperclip, which was a US government project to basically snag as many smart German engineers as they could find and put them to work in the US. Uh, what's impressive is Losnitzer managed to uh, basically get his career to the same point in the US that he had in Germany. By 1957 he was appointed as director, was it, uh, supervising engineer for Springfield Armory's research and development department on small arms. <laughs> and he, he ended up working at Springfield Armory for 18 years until the armory closed down. At that point he went to work for Army Material Command, he retired at the required age of 70, went to work for a private company in Waukesha, Wisconsin, did development on things like aluminum cartridge cases. The guy was, in every sense of the word, a true expert in particularly automatic firearms. Um, he was at Springfield, he was responsible for, among other guns, the, uh, the 20mm Vulcan cannon that a lot of people are familiar with, the entire armament package for the AH-56 Comanche helicopter. This guy was a consummate fire professional firearms nerd. And what's really cool is we actually have a, an, orally, an oral memoir of his time at Mauser. So this book specifically covers what he did from 33 to 45, uh, and it's, it's highly technical. So this is, he doesn't really talk about his family, he doesn't really talk about his personal life at all. This is what did he do and what did Mauser do during this time frame, which is of course the most interesting time frame for Mauser, really. It's, uh, he set up the R&D department that would lead to a ton of Mauser's and Germany's really interesting high-tech small arms during World War II. So the story behind the book is almost as interesting as the story behind Losnitzer. In the 70s he had a friend named Leslie Field who convinced him to actually put some of his memoirs down on paper. Uh, the problem was at this point Losnitzer was pretty much blind. Uh, couldn't type himself, and so and and he didn't have the income to like hire someone to dictate memoirs to. So Field kind of poked around for some ideas and ended up finding a local high school in Waukesha, Wisconsin, that had an advanced typing class that needed some material. And so he came to this arrangement that Losnitzer would come in and dictate his memoirs to a series of high school girls in the advanced typing class who would transcribe and type the whole thing. Uh, Field then went through it and edited it for typos and such, and then they went to look for a publisher, and they were unable to find a publisher because, well, this is a really niche sort of book. This is very technical and will not appeal to the vast majority of book buyers out there. Um, even a, a, the, the majority of people interested in World War II history, this is probably a little too technical and a little too in-depth for what they'd be looking for. So the manuscript kind of sat around until it came to the attention of a guy named Hank Visser, who was a part owner of Mauser, part owner of HK, very interesting man in his own right, a uh, Dutch citizen. And uh, Visser was very interested in the history of Mauser and arranged to have the book published. I should say Visser was also quite wealthy. Um, so this was published in 2011 uh, by, actually it was finalized after Hank Visser passed away. Uh, his estate finally finished printing it. In 2011 and it came onto the market by way of uh, Andrew Mowbray or uh, Man at Arms. So it is now actually, well it was printed, and I'm very sure that this is the sort of book that will only have one printing. Uh, I don't know how many copies are still left at this point, but 
for the person who is interested in technical firearms development, this is a book you should absolutely not miss. It is chock full of interesting, not just interesting developmental information, but also really interesting anecdotes about how weapons development worked at Mauser during World War II and the lead up to World War II. Uh, two, of the, two of the anecdotes that stick out to me. Uh, one of them was when they were working on developing uh, anti-aircraft cannon. They needed some place where they could actually test fire the things, and going to a military range was a huge pain in the butt, because they had to get permission and oversight and all sorts of obnoxious things that they didn't want to deal with. They just wanted their own range where they could go whenever they wanted and shoot some 40 millimeter uh, cannons up into the air and see how everything worked. So they ended up finding this basically big open area up in the mountains. Uh, no one no one really lived out there. There was a little town at one end and they Mauser made an arrangement with this town to have access to this big, I mean kilometers of open uh, mountain plain, open mountain field. And they you know they'd close off the road when they were shooting, but they could go up there basically whenever they wanted. And it worked really well until they discovered shortly after beginning that when they fired at a very steep angle, almost straight up, they didn't really think about how the wind might be different at high altitude compared to low, and they ended up dropping some explosive anti-aircraft artillery shells behind the gun, disturbingly close to the town uh, during one of their early firing sessions. Oops. After that they started paying more attention to some of the aviation type uh, weather meteorology data, uh, checking the actual the, the wind speeds at high altitude as well as at ground level and planning around their firing. Um, one of the other interesting anecdotes, Lossnitzer does touch on political subjects here, of course the Nazi party was in charge of Germany at the time, and he has an interesting anecdote from uh, February of 1934 when the Mauser company was trying to get a contract for small arms production for Persia, or Iran as we call them today. And part of this deal was uh, the Persians were going to have 12 ordnance officers come over and spend a year at Oberndorf at the Mauser factory, basically learning the trade. Um, and acting as, uh, they were going to be the group of officers that would be, that would do the acceptance or rejection of the final guns. So town of Oberndorf is going to host these guys for a year, it's kind of a, a big deal. Well uh, there's a big Mardi Gras, basically Mardi Gras celebration in February in Germany, big huge party, uh, these 12 Iranian officers go out and, and they're having a good time on the town with some, some officers who are there to escort them, and uh, you know, party starts heating up, they start dancing. Uh, with, with the girls who had shown up. Well, the local police chief from Stuttgart had also come down for the celebration, and he was a, I don't know about fanatical, but a pretty devoted Nazi party appointee, and what he saw was not Persians dancing with German girls, he saw dark-skinned, curly-haired guys who were probably Jewish dancing with German girls, and kind of lost his mind, uh, had their escorting officers thrown in prison, and had the Persian uh, delegation sent back to their hotel. Uh, they were visiting foreign dignitaries and couldn't be arrested outright, so they were sent back to their hotel. This really pissed off the Persian delegates. Losnitzer, as one of the directors of Mauser at the time, had to deal with this the next morning, got his officers out of jail, spent an entire day with the uh, the mayor of Oberndorf trying to smooth the situation over with these this group of Persian officers. Didn't really work, and Mauser ended up losing the entire contract to the Brno factory in Czechoslovakia, who would supply uh, Persia with the Mausers that we are now familiar with as gun collectors. So those are the sorts of, of little stories and anecdotes that are in here amongst a whole lot of technical development information. Uh, the book is just under 400 pages, and it is actually only about one-third uh, memoirs of Losnitzer, and the other two-thirds are, are, are a couple appendices of other data. Uh, primarily it's like two and a half years of monthly Mauser technical reports, uh, reports on the status of all the different projects that they were working on in the R&D department um, from 43 until the end of the war. That's really cool data to actually have translated and compiled here. There's also a complete uh, compiled copy of the CIOS report, that's the Allied, basically the Allied intelligence report on Mauser, uh, involving interviews or interrogations with the major employees and an assessment of what was at the factory at the end of the war. So that was something that was put together uh, by the Allies as they, basically as they occupied Germany. 
So that's in there, as, as well as a few other smaller appendices. So really this is a gold mine of information for the person who is really looking for in-depth technical information. If you're, yeah, if you're just looking for some information on, I want to collect a, a CAR 98K or two, or you know, I'm interested in how the MG42 was actually used in World War II, this isn't really the book for you. Um, this is for guys who are really into the, the technical gunsmithing and gun design elements of that sort of history. So if that's you, uh, there is a link in the description text below to uh, Man at Arms, to Andrew Mowbray, where this is currently still in stock, at least for the time being. Uh, price on it is 50 bucks, so a little expensive, but I guarantee you, I know I say this a lot, but I guarantee this is a book that when it sells out, there's no way anyone's ever going to reprint this thing, because it is just too niche of a book, um, too specific of a subject matter. So uh, take advantage of the opportunity now to get a copy of Lost Nietzsche's memoir, because I'm really sure you won't regret it. Thanks for watching, stick around next week for another book review from ForgottenWeapons.com.